You're listening to Reach MD, the channel for medical professionals. Welcome to Hot Topics in Allergy, presented by the American College of Allergy, Asthma, and Immunology. I'm Dr. Daniel Ein, president of the ACAAI, an association of 4,000 allergy health providers dedicated to enhancing the care of our patients through education and research. Your host will be Dr. Todd A. Marr. Dr. Marr practices pediatric allergy and immunology at Gunderson Lutheran Medical Center in La Crosse, Wisconsin. Acetylsalicylic acid, or aspirin, something that we see as health providers daily, whether patients are taking it for prevention or for treatment. But what do we do with those patients who are intolerant to aspirin? And so today we're going to review an article in July 2007, Annals of Allergy, Asthma, and Immunology, titled Pathogenesis, Diagnosis, and Treatment of Aspirin Intolerance. That's going to be the focus of our Hot Topics in Allergy today. I'm Dr. Todd Marr, and joining me is Dr. Stephen Tillis. Dr. Tillis is Clinical Assistant Professor at the University of Washington School of Medicine and in private practice at Northwest Asthma and Allergy Center, Seattle, Washington. Steve, welcome. Thanks. It's a pleasure to be here, Todd. In general, aspirin's fairly well tolerated, but occasionally people have a variety of potentially serious adverse effects and intolerances. So aspirin intolerance represents a serious but often underestimated problem. How common is this, and and when did we first see this? Well, this has been a common problem, actually, since early in the 1900s. I think in 1911, it was first described as an acute asthma reaction that happened after taking aspirin. And in fact, respiratory symptoms, either asthma or nasal symptoms or together, have been a very concerning problem for a lot of patients with asthma who also need to take aspirin or even other anti-inflammatory medications such as ibuprofen, naproxen, or any of the prescription anti-inflammatories as well. Isn't there a classic triad that's been described with aspirin intolerance? Yes, there is, Todd. The triad is actually probably a misnomer because there's more than three problems that can happen, but it was a classically described in the 60s as called Samter's triad, and it includes any of the following. One would be asthma in a patient with chronic asthma. Another would be nasal polyps, which are benign growths in the nose and sinuses that affect a lot of people with allergies and asthma. Also, chronic sinusitis is quite common in these patients. And interestingly enough, many of them are not allergic to things in the air, like many of us who say are allergic to cats or or trees or grass. Many patients with aspirin intolerance with these respiratory symptoms are technically non-allergic, even though they all for the world appear to be allergic to aspirin. Do we also see skin symptoms with aspirin intolerance? Yes, you do. Uh, It's usually not in the same patients, but certainly other patients can have immediate reactions to aspirin that are similar to reactions people have with penicillin, for example, with hives all over their body or swelling that can be at least very close to life-threatening symptoms. Technically, very few of them are true allergy. Most of them are not mediated by antibodies like IgE, yet they are potentially life-threatening and are due to the inhibition of cyclooxygenase in general. So they they tend to cross-react between all of the uh, anti-inflammatories. So the triad, as we mentioned, Samter's triad or the aspirin triad, really usually does not include the urticaria or angioedema. Exactly. That's what's been renamed now is aspirin-associated respiratory disease. Okay. And then aspirin intolerance is really kind of a global term for all of them put together. Exactly. I think if you think of a pyramid, uh, you could say adverse reactions to aspirin include both aspirin-induced urticaria and angioedema, or, and then on the other side, more of an aspirin-induced respiratory disease. The actual True IgE-mediated aspirin adverse reactions are very rare. So how common is this to see aspirin intolerance? Well, in the average population, it's about somewhere between 0.3% and 0.9% of the general population. There are no particular racial differences, and though there tend to be more females affected than males. As I mentioned, there is no predilection for respiratory allergy among the aspirin-allergic patients. 
but it's among asthmatics, especially non-allergic asthmatics, it's uh, much more common. You are listening to Hot Topics in Allergy, presented by the American College of Allergy, Asthma, and Immunology on ReachMD, XM, the channel for medical professionals. I'm Dr. Todd Marr, and I'm speaking with Dr. Stephen Tillis, and we are discussing aspirin sensitivity and intolerance. Where do you begin to see that classic aspirin triad or aspirin tolerance developing? What ages usually? Now that Motrin and other forms of ibuprofen have a pediatric indication, you do see it in in children. It's not not as common. It's more common in non-allergic asthmatics, which often tend to begin in middle adulthood. There was a study in at Seattle Children's Hospital about two or three years ago that showed, I think it was about 10% of, of kids with asthma that had some asthma response after taking ibuprofen. So definitely with something we can see in children. What about the general population? When do we begin to see it in adulthood? Is it in the 30s or the 40s? The classic aspirin triad develops between age 30 and 35 years of age. And generally, it, it may happen first or it may be after the onset of asthma and nasal polyposis. Once patients develop this chronic asthma chronic sinusitis, nasal polyposis, it becomes much more common. It can be even 20% of patients in those populations usually will let patients know to be careful. It's a, it's a dilemma because, of course, these medicines are very important for a wide variety of indications from, you know, of course, headache and fever, but also prophylaxis for, for cardiac risk. Many times we there's a dilemma in terms of whether to empirically avoid it, wait for a reaction, and then what to do if we know the patient is intolerant. Yeah, with its inhibitory effect on platelet aggregation, it's really the first choice for prophylaxis of strokes and myocardial infarction and thromboembolism. So I know I see it in my practice a lot, and it's definitely something that it's it's hard to take somebody off of once they've been on it, but then they do come in sometimes with these reactions. What are the clinical manifestations that you see in aspirin intolerance? Well, in the most important aspirin intolerance that, we, that we're talking, they differ in severity and frequency depending on the dosage, the drug in question, whether it be aspirin versus ibuprofen versus naproxen, for example. It might, as we've discussed earlier, affect the skin or the respiratory tract. Usually, if it's the skin, it's hives or angioedema. If it's res- respiratory tract, it's some combination of bronchospasm with wheezing, chest tightness, shortness of breath, rhino or rhinitis, acute rhinitis with nasal congestion, uh, rhinorrhea, etc. So if a patient has a reaction to aspirin, when are you going to see that? Uh, typically, the symptoms will begin pretty quickly, within 15, 20 minutes. On the outside, maybe an hour, hour and a half. But we will not see significant differences are significant symptoms due to aspirin, say, the next day. So that, so I think uh, patients, if they've had it and, and not had symptoms two hours afterwards, I think they can safely be said not to be intolerant. So with patients that the general provider might be seeing, aspirin intolerance, I think, is generally underdiagnosed, kind of despite its relatively high incidence. And we should really consider it in individuals showing chronic respiratory disease or recurrent skin diseases like urticaria or angioedema. But usually there should be this temporal relation back to ingestion of aspirin within a few hours, correct? Certainly the bronchospasm or respiratory disease, it should not be too surprising to the patient. I mean, they should have some suspicion, and I think it would help all primary providers to to realize that that association so they specifically ask for it, especially if the symptoms weren't particularly severe. With chronic urticaria, it's actually the majority of patients with chronic hives whose hives will be worse on days that they've taken aspirin or other non-steroidal. So it, again, will happen relatively quickly, but isn't necessarily at all life-threatening. It's a, it's sort of an exacerbation of what they already have. It's very important because the patients may not realize it. And so as clinicians, it's important to specifically ask if patients have chronic hives, whether they take over-the-counter non-steroidals, and if so, they noticed an association, and if not, then if they're not sure, then a, a trial off of it would be reasonable to see if their hives improve. Do we have an understanding of the pathogenetic mechanism of aspirin intolerance? I know it's complex, and I've done some reading, but I'm not sure we, we really know. I know there's hypothesis out there. What do you think, Steve? We know a lot more than we used to. As I mentioned earlier, it's not typically an IgE-mediated reaction. So technically, it's not allergy. 
in the classic textbooks, we would classify this as a pseudo-allergic reaction. For example, there's no required sensitization phase. So you can have a reaction on the very first dose of a drug, having never had it in your whole life. As I mentioned, it's more common for patients to develop this later in life, though again, it's not a, a sensitization. We do know that it's a selective inhibition of cyclooxygenase, and we now know there's two different types of cyclooxygenase, the COX-1 and the COX-2. The drugs known to be cross-reactive with inhibition of COX-1 are aspirin and most other NSAIDs, and those are particularly problematic with aspirin intolerance. So it seems to be dependent on that COX-1 pathway. The COX-2 inhibitors, such as celecoxib, for example, tend not to, to cause these pseudoallergic reactions, even though, disappointingly, they've had a lot of GI side effects that were more of a problem for the general population with non in general. For us in allergy, when we have patients with uh, aspirin intolerance, for example, or, or non intolerance in general, we can usually do quite well by just switching them over to the COX-2 inhibitor. So I know there's been a lot of research going on into diagnostic methods that are maybe available for this, but is there really good testing, in vitro type testing, that can be used exclusively for aspirin intolerance? Unfortunately, the diagnostic testing, as with most drugs in general, when we talk about adverse drug reactions, has been disappointing. We don't really have, we certainly cannot reliably skin test to identify patients with aspirin intolerance. There have been some experimental uses of measuring urinary leukotrienes, et cetera. But for all intents and purposes, there really isn't anything that we as clinicians, even as specialists, can rely on, unfortunately. So we're really left with provocative tests, correct? Yes. Obviously, we start with a detailed history to try to establish a pretest probability. And then, actually, I, I like to say to patients and, and other, say, for example, primary physicians, when I speak to them about it, that we want to establish the risk of not using the drug. In other words, how important is the use of this drug in this patient's life? If they've had a stroke or have had a, a myocardial infarction, there is no better prophylaxis against death than, than aspirin. And so, obviously, the risk of not using it is quite high. Thank you for listening to Hot Topics in Allergy on ReachMD, the channel for medical professionals. This show has been presented by the American College of Allergy, Asthma, and Immunology. For more information on the ACAAI, please visit www.acaai.org.